What's up, Cerebral NFL fans? This is Steve Heider, Gate City Sports Media Company, and a little different setup today, guys. I'm coming from you from the couch area. I want it to be a little bit more comfortable. I wanted this to feel a little less formal and a little bit, you know, more informal for this particular one. So the topic today, you guys probably noticed right from the jump from the title of the video is, I'm talking about where does cornerback Darius Slay rank amongst the Philadelphia Eagles great? When I was doing some research for this one, because I'll be honest with you guys. I was born in 83, so I, I missed a, an era of football that did have some pretty good cornerback play that took us to the Super Bowl. And it, I can't really speak other than as a the historical part of like Herman Edwards and, and Roy Nell Young. I, I can't speak to like, you know, I was just a kid when they, those guys were really playing. Like I was, it was well beyond my understanding of football at the time when they were playing. But with that said, I, I kind of grew up, came to age, if you will, during the Eric Allen era. And then I really came into my own during the Troy Vincent and Bobby Taylor era. That's that's like the era of football I kind of grew up into. So I'm excited to kind of bring this conversation because we've had some greats. Let me just lay out the the people that I kind of weighed in and judged in and on, and I'll, I'll define the way I did this, right? So Herman Edwards, Raynell Young, Eric Allen, Mark McMillan, Bobby Taylor, Troy Vincent, Lito Shepard, Sheldon Brown, Asante Samuel. I took a look at things like DRC, Dominique, Rogers, Cromarty. I didn't necessarily include them because I don't think it's like upper tier level. You can certainly make an argument that if we're just talking about, you know, guys that have some kind of fit and they were a great feel for the Eagles for a little bit of time. I definitely think you can make a case that, you know, Ronald Darby did his job in 2017, but I, I wouldn't conclude him in the grades. You know what I mean? Uh, don't get me wrong. I mean, Jalen Mills did his job. I mean, we few really huge pass breakups from Jalen Mills that propelled us to the Super Bowl. So, I mean, I'm not going to discount those guys, but I wouldn't call them great just because they're certainly important to the conversation of Philadelphia Eagles cornerbacks, but not quite in this tier of guys we're talking about today. You know what I mean? What's up, Austin? How are you doing? Sam, the artist formerly known as S4L. He said, bum, I missed the last couple of days of live streams because I noticed at least a couple of snaps that J.J. Ortega Whiteside lined up as a third tight end. On the goal line in our last game, I'm curious your opinion on performance. I'd have to look at it a little bit more. Uh, we can do that in a film breakdown with Allie or something. We'll, we'll take a look at something like that. So getting into the history and the significance here, right? When I look at, like, what, what was it about the numbers that kind of drew me in here to say, like, Darius Slay is kind of, he's performing better than what would have been anticipated. And one of the things that really tipped me off, guys, and made me feel like, hey, you know, we really do need to kind of talk about Terry Slay's play, is that when you just look at all coverage, when you look at man coverage snaps, he's recently been rated as the number one man coverage corner. And the Eagles have been scaling up towards a lot of man coverage over the past three weeks. That's kind of a little hidden secret about the Philadelphia Eagles is that Gannon's system is definitely a, a high man, or, uh, sorry, a high zone coverage system. But here of recent, he's been playing a lot more man. We're, we're starting to become like actually one of the higher man coverage systems in the league. And it's kind of a little unknown about Gannon's system over the past three or four weeks that there's been a little bit of a changing there. With that said, when you look at all coverage, so man zone doesn't matter. The number one rated corner is AJ Terrell. Number two is Jalen Ramsey. Number three is Darius Slay with a, a grade of 83.9. This is PFF guys. I'm not necessarily a huge fan of PFF or anything like that, but PFS is an, you know, it's an impartial, judge here it's not an eagle fan saying it is you know it's pff it's a group of guys who evaluate the game who come up with that rating in particular so darius slay is performing at a really high level as a matter of fact when we look at like the top 12 here are your top 12 corners right aj terrell jalen ramsey darius slaves three jc jackson four jamel dean five rashad fenton six mike hughes seven adoree jackson eight Russell douglas is nine Kendall Fuller is 10, Denzel Ward is 11, and then Marshawn Lattimore is 12. I do filter these statics by 20%. I don't want dudes that didn't play too much. And to be honest with you, I filtered even further because even when I filtered by 20%, Stephen Gilmore was still kind of ranking in that top 12, but he's only he's played under 200 snaps. It just didn't feel right to include him in that list because even though Stephen Gilmore is still a top 12 corner, not, not in this season, guys. He didn't play enough snaps for me to include that. Uh, I did take a look just so you guys don't ask me, like, where did the nickel cornerbacks line up? Avante Maddox is ranking fifth among grades for the uh, nickel cornerback position. So uh, Chidobi, 
Owuzie. I don't know how you say that guy's name. You know what I'm talking about. The guy used to play for Dallas. Number one rated corner in terms of nickels. Akilo Witherspoon is number two. Not a surprise there. He's a really good player. Uh, Tavier Thomas is three. Nate Hobbs is four. Avante Maddox is five in terms of the nickel corners. The only downside here, guys, is looking at it from an impartial viewpoint. PFF ranked Steven Nelson 87th with a 59.6 grade. I, you know, Steven Nelson, I think, has been probably a little better than they're giving him credit for, but he's certainly nowhere near the top 50. I would agree with that. That He's not really performing at a top 50 level in terms of his coverage. But I don't think he's quite as bad as they made him out to be personally, but that's just a personal opinion. That's not the, you know, that's not an impartial viewpoint here. Now, what I will say is this, guys, looking at the history of the game, uh, the two guys I'm going to start off by talking with about shaping this conversation about Eagles all-time greats starts with Herman Edwards. I love Herman, man. Herm was, you know, such a great player He's before my generation. Loved him as a coach. Loved him when he was a commentator. Herm's, you know, he's just a football guy. Like everything about Herman Edwards, you know, yells football to me when, when I think of Herman Edwards. So the thing that most Eagle fans are going to know him for, whether you were alive during this game or not, is the miracle at the Meadowlands. That's what he's known for. And just to talk about how important the miracle of the Meadowlands were, we got to keep in mind, it wasn't until 1976 that the scoreboard was implemented. So before that, really the time was kept by the refs. So it was a little difficult for offenses to know how much time exactly was left on the clock. With saying that, when you basically tried to close out games, you're under two minutes, you're under two minute offense trying to run the clock out. A lot of times you did, you know, lead draws with your fullbacks or your running backs, quarterback sneaks, quarterback draws even. You did things that are a little different than we're used to in the game today. Well, one of those lead draws was to Larry Zonka, who fumbled the football for the Giants. And Herm Edwards recovers the football, takes it in. Eagles win. Eagles end up going into the playoffs that year. And the Giants end up only winning six games that year. Because of that, that's where the victory formation came from. Before that, teams thought it was kind of, you know, the, the, the view around the league was is that you were kind of weak if you did that. Like that was a cop out. To, to go into the victory formation, to do those things, to use your quarterback on a kneel down. After that, the Giants took so much criticism that they started calling it the Herm Edwards play. That's the kind of impact that Herm Edwards had on the organization. Now, I will say that in terms of his play, we got to keep in mind, Herm, Herm Edwards was a good football player. He played in Philly for a long time until Buddy Ryan kind of cut him in 86 when Buddy came in. But he had 33 interceptions. He's second among all cornerbacks. Cornerbacks. Key distinction here. Cornerbacks inside the Philadelphia Eagles organization. He only really trails Eric Allen by one interception. So, I mean, that's the kind of impact that Herm Edwards had as a player. Like I said, before my generation, still a great football player, tremendous football player. The next guy I want to talk about created the first tandem that I've heard my father and other people talk about. You know, people that are a little older than me. My brother's not even quite old enough to remember this era. He was still just a youngin too. But the first tandem was Herman Edwards and Roy Nell Young. That was our Super Bowl tandem because Roy Nell Young, I believe, was a rookie the Super Bowl year in 80. He was the 23rd overall draft pick, I believe, in the 1980 draft. He ended up having four interceptions over his first three seasons each season. So, you know, 12 interceptions over the first three years that he had an Eagles uniform on. Um, he was a pro bowler. His second year in the league, 1981, became a pro bowler. He's a member of the Black College Football Hall of Fame. And first year with Buddy Ryan in 86, man, the first year Buddy came in. You know, you got Herman Edwards leaving. You got Roy Nell Young now becoming the guy. He had six interceptions that season. I mean, highly productive guy. Not not someone I'm overly familiar with, to be quite honest, Roy Nell Young. But just looking at the numbers, watching a little bit of, like, classic film, uh, apparently he was a very good football player. A little bit before my generation, like I said, guys. I was just a teeny bopper at that time. The third guy I want to talk about is the guy I remember the most. This is, like, my childhood here, and that's Eric Allen. Eric Allen is widely viewed as probably being the most playmaking of everybody here next to him and Asante Samuel, you kind of go back and forth on, right. As being the playmakers that came in here. Uh, Eric Allen kind of shocked me because when I was a kid, I always thought of Eric Allen being like this big, you know, corner. I thought he was like six, one, six, two come to find out. No, man, he was built like Asante Samuel, Lito Shepard. He was like five ten, like one eighty five ish. I, I never realized that guys. I mean, I was a young guy, you know, what can I say? I was really young at that time that you're talking like, I don't know, late elementary, early, you know, middle school <laughs> kind of time frame for me. He was an incredible playmaker, man. I mean, the thing I remember the most about Eric Allen that will always kind of live in memory of like who Eric Allen was as a player was the playoffs in the uh, early 90s where we played New Orleans and he took that interception to the house. That's the one that always kind of stands out in my mind as the type of playmaker he was. 
And he also stands out in my mind because, you know, we always talk about 93 in free agency. And we talk about how in 93, how we lost Reggie White to free agency. Well, it was a couple of years later, we lost Eric Allen to New Orleans in free agency, which is a little ironic, right? So that one stands out to me, right? I will say that he had a couple of like crazy years. He was a first team pro bowler in 89, had eight interceptions underneath that Buddy Ryan defense and Bud Carson defense. I mean, crazy productive there. In 93, he had a crazy season where he scored four touchdowns off of interceptions. He forced three fumbles in 93. I mean, he just he was such an impact player. He leads the Eagles franchise in interceptions with 34, which you know, obviously puts him number one overall. Like Eric Allen was an incredible playmaker. And I'm not going to talk too long on Mark McMillan just because a lot of people, unless you were kind of around during that time, you, you probably don't remember Mighty Mouse. Uh, the biggest thing I will say about the Eric Allen and Mark McMillan era has to do with their heights. You know, you got Mark McMillan was like 5'7", maybe. <laughs> you know, Eric Allen was like 5'10". What I remember is really solid play from those two guys. That they were really, really good football players. But if I'm being honest and I'm being true about things, we kind of struggled with the more physical elements of Dallas's team. And, and like, you know, th those two guys performed really well across the league. But we kind of got taken a, a few times by Dallas because they just had Michael Irvin and guys that were just bigger, physical, Jay Novacek, tight end. Like, we just didn't really have – we have really good playmakers on the outside, but not necessarily the kind of guys that – to go up there and, and like really challenge you physically. It wasn't quite the same. Although the game is different. You can fight back more. Which brings me, you know, Eric Allen and Mark McMillan was the second kind of cornerback tandem on the list that I have here. The third cornerback tandem really starts following Eric Allen's departure and then the drafting of this young man. That's Bobby Taylor. Bobby Taylor is so different from any other corner that we're going to talk about today. Like, straightforward. Bobby Taylor was like, Richard Sherman before there was a Richard Sherman, man. Six foot three, 215, 220-ish. Probably a little bit more athletically gifted than Richard Sherman, to be quite honest. But, man, he was just that style of cornerback, right? You got to think about the Michael Irvins of the day, right? He's coming in, right? I think about a year before we got – I think it was – we got Bobby Taylor, I think, the year before we got Brian Dawkins. So, physically, the Eagles are changing in the secondary, right? And just that, that season, that 99 season, where we ended up having Troy Vinton on one side, Bobby Taylor on the other side, Brian Dawkins at free safety. The Eagles physically were just a completely different football team. That were some of my favorite teams. In 99, we struck. It was just magical with Jim Johnson's system coming in here with Andy Reid. And Andy Reid really had, for almost the duration of his entire time in Philadelphia, just had exceptional corner play. Just the way that we were able to produce corners inside of Jim Johnson's you know, scheme I mean, we just we had a, we had a really good run, guys. I don't know how else to say it other than it was a crazy, crazy good run. What I will say about Bobby Taylor is that his past numbers defensed. The amount of times he got in and broke balls up, man, the, the dude was just phenomenal at it. I mean, he had the the skill set, the size, and things like that to be really successful. And it just it stood out, man. I mean, nineteen nine you know interceptions for his Eagles career. He was a Pro Bowler in two thousand and two. Uh, and like I said, that ninety nine season with him and and uh, Troy Vincent. And Brian Dawkins was pretty special. Uh, goes to my next point, Troy Vincent. What I'll say about Troy Vincent is this is where things get argumentative when people talk about like who the greatest corner was. For me, Troy Vincent is my favorite corner. Troy Vincent was just so fundamentally sound and just uh, the way he played the game just resonated with me. I will always remember, you know what I'm saying, like Troy Vincent and how good of a football player he was. Now, I was also kind of coming of age at this time. We were talking about you know, upper years of high school playing football, you know, getting ready to graduate. So, I mean, I kind of came to age around this time. So that's probably why I have, an, you know, such a belief about Troy Vincent. But that Bobby Taylor, Troy Vincent combination at corner to me was the best cornerback tandem I, I saw from Philly. Now, mind you, I wasn't old enough for the Herman Edwards and Roy Nell Young tandem. So I, I don't know how good that tandem was. So I'm a little out of my element because I can't judge that tandem. But from what I saw, Bobby Taylor and Troy Vincent was the absolute best tandem of everyone we're going to name here, right? Troy Vincent went to five straight Pro, Pro Bowls from 99 through 2003. It's incredible, man. Uh, 99, the 99 season, that, that he was seven interceptions underneath Jim Johnson. He was such a special football player, such a special talent. Like, Troy Vincent is still to this day is my favorite defensive back for Philly, and, and I love Asante Samuel. I love those other dudes, but it was just the way, the technique that he played the game with. Lito Shepard. Another wildly underrated guy, very similar in stature to Eric Allen, Sante Samuel, five foot ten, a little bit more solidly built. He was like around the 190, 195-ish kind of mark. 
But I mean, he was that kind of athletic playmaker. And, and that's kind of what people forget about Lito Shepard is he was a guy that could pick you off, force fumbles. He, he scored, he put points on the board for you from the defensive side of things. Um, the problem with Lito is he ended up suffering those injuries and he just was never the same player after he hurt the knees and stuff. He just, he didn't quite come back the same, but his early career was exceptional, man. I mean, 2004, he becomes a first team pro bowler. His first time starting, not necessarily his first season. He wasn't a rookie, but I think it was his first full time season as a starter. And he becomes a, you know, first team pro bowler right from the jump. Right. Um, man, that 2004 and six season, they were just incredible, man. Five interceptions and four, six interceptions in 2006. He had a couple of just really, really solid years, man. Leo Shepard was probably the guy that I really think of. And I think to myself, like, man, what could have been, what could have been if he stayed healthy? Because I think he's so much better than people realize. I mean, he was such a good football player. And, you know, that's kind of that third, if you will, tandem I'll talk about, which was the Lido Shepard and Sheldon Brown tandem. And what I kind of left off of the Bobby Taylor tandem is like, there was a time we had Bobby Taylor, Troy Vincent, Lido Shepard, Sheldon Brown, and I think Al Harris. Like to think about how freaking good that secondary was early for Jim Johnson. Like, man, I would kill to have something like that now. Like that is such a ridiculous level in terms of how good your players are. Past that, you know, you have Sheldon Brown. Sheldon Brown, in my opinion, is the best cornerback that I've ever talked about that didn't make a Pro Bowl. I always felt like Sheldon Brown was disrespected in that regard, and he was a better player than people thought. He lacked foot speed, right? I mean, he wasn't quite as slow as a guy like – I don't want to burn people, man, but he wasn't quite Jalen Mills slow, but he wasn't a fast guy, right? He just wasn't a quick foot speed guy. He was a physical fight you kind of, you know, corner. I'll say that the 2009 season with Asante Samuel, that was a special season between Asante and Sheldon Brown, man. Even Sheldon Brown put up five interceptions that year. And Asante Samuel set the, I'm going to get to it, but Asante Samuel set the franchise record for interceptions that season. Like, special, special play, man. Uh, he had a knack for touchdowns and forced fumbles. It's one thing that people forget about Sheldon Brown is that the young man could take the ball away. He could force fumbles. He was a bit of a playmaker, even though he's a bigger guy. And to be honest with you, he, you know, nine seasons straight, or not nine seasons straight, nine seasons in total where he forced a fumble. That's a pretty crazy marker to talk about a cornerback. Sheldon Brown had nine of his seasons, nine separate seasons where he forced the fumble. Come on, man. There's just, it's hard to find that kind of production in the NFL. Like He was such an underrated football player. Asante Samuel. Asante Samuel is kind of the last guy I'm going to talk about in terms of like the great greats until we talk a little bit about Darius Slay and we get into the comments. Asante Samuel, three-time Pro Bowler with the Eagles from 2008, 2010, three straight seasons. Set the franchise records for interceptions with nine in 2009. Most people always attribute that to Troy Vincent having it in 99 with seven interceptions. But truth be told, uh, if I'm being honest, Eric Allen had a season, I think, in like 89 where he had eight interceptions. I don't know why that always gets referenced because Eric Allen actually outdid Troy Vincent, but I, I don't know. Maybe it's because they weren't really keeping common stats back then, and, and it's a, I don't know, maybe they're estimating. It's really hard to say, guys. I, I really don't know, but it seems off to me. Asante Samuel had a, a – the body type was very similar to an Eric Allen, very similar to a Lito Shepard. I do think that Asante was clearly the best short zone player out, out of these three, right? You can make an, you can make an argument that I'm, I'm discounting because of how young I was, how good Eric Allen was in the short zone. But Asante was exceptional in off coverage short zone where, man, if he read the quarterback's eyes, he's taking a football. That dude was the best short zone player I've ever watched. And his son's pretty dang good at it too. Asante Samuel Jr. His son's, Really, really good at that, right? The other thing about Asante was, young. He, look, he forced fumbles. He took the ball away. He scored touchdowns for you. He was just an absolute playmaker, just like Eric Allen. Just like Lito had those couple of seasons where it looked like he was going to be that, that type of player. And then he suffered the injuries. Asante kind of was part of, a, was part of two separate tandems. So the first tandem, you know, was Sheldon Brown and Asante Samuel. And then in 2011, we brought DRC in, Dominique rogers Cromarty, And then we ended up trading was a pretty bad idea. This is, I think Asante Samuel is the uh, golden example of trading a guy a year too early instead of keeping him a year too late. We traded him a year too early, I think to Atlanta where he had a big season for Atlanta that next year. And then he just, he was done after that 2012 season. And I believe that was like the first year that Howie had like kind of the ropes handed to him. Cause you got to remember how he was kind of under even Andy after he first got hired. I mean, Andy still was kind of mentoring Howie at first people, people kind of lose sight of that, but that's the truth. Howie, 
it wasn't really to 2012 that he, you know, the last year Andy was here that he kind of got a little bit more, you know, power over the organization. At first he was GM, but he was the youngest GM in NFL history. And he was very much being mentored by Andy Reid. It's kind of something that gets lost in the conversations about Howie Roseman. That was the tandems though, guys. I mean, the, the, just how ridiculously good the Andy Reid era tandems were at cornerback. I mean, dude, we started off the Andy Reid era with Bobby Taylor and Troy Vincent. So from that to Lito Shepard and Sheldon Brown, from Sheldon Brown to Asante Samuel. See, even probably the worst of the group was Asante Samuel and freaking DRC. Just the level of play that we became accustomed to at cornerback spoiled the crap out of us as Eagle fans. I mean, we're talking about from 1980 when Roy Nell Young paired up with Herman Edwards all the way through to 2000 and freaking 12, man, from, or to 20, the end of the 2011 season. I mean, we're talking about 90, 2000, 2000. We're talking about over 30 years of pretty dang good corner play, man. I think that's part of the reason why when we went through the, the hard years between 2012 and really like, I'd say until about 2017 when we, we kind of got Darby and we had that special season with Darby and Mills. And then you kind of, we slumped again and now we're having adequate play. You know, we got Darius Slay. I think Darius Slay is absolutely in this conversation, although I don't think he's as good as some of these guys. But I think Slay's the this kind of impact player. From Darius Slay to like, you know, other dudes that we can talk about. And I think Darius Slay is a little bit more towards the Herman Edwards and Roy Nell Young type of corner. I don't think he's like an Eric Allen. I don't think he's a Lido Shepard type. I don't think that he's a an Asante Samuel type. He's not like a short zone guy. He's just an all around good corner. I do think there are some distinguishing marks there, but he's a playmaker. He's still a playmaker. We all know that about him. Um, but I think he's, you know, his main attribute is just solid coverage. Because if you only judge him off his playmaking ability, it's not even really fair to talk about him with Asante Samuel, to talk about him with, you know, guys like, you know, I, I would even say, like, even talking about him in the Troy Vincent realm of things, even Troy Vincent was an excellent, like I said, Troy Vincent's my favorite corner. But, you know, you can't put him in Eric Allen. You can't put him in the conversation with even probably Asante Samuel. I think it is fair to talk about him in terms of Leo Shepard because Shepard didn't have the duration of success. But what an error. What an error of football. And, man, having Avante Maddox a top five slot corner this year, and then on the outside we have the number one man coverage graded cornerback and Darius Slay, and the number three overall graded cornerback, if you filter by 20% of snaps. You know, even though the opposite side here, we only have, like, pretty adequate play from Steve Nelson, who's ranked 87th if you go by PFF's grade. And I think they're being a little harsh, personally, but I'm not going to argue with them because I don't know why they graded them that way. Like, I don't have an explanation necessarily for why they did that. But nonetheless (laughs) – we had a very, very good era of football, guys. No doubt about it. What's up, Dante Hill? How are you doing, sir? I'm doing very, very, very well this morning. Drew Johnson said, I finally caught another live. Thank you, Drew. I appreciate you being here, man. Jay Milton from New Jersey with the NC Central logo. What's good, buddy? So Gate City Sports Talk, the godfather of film breakdown. Good to catch you live. Hey, I appreciate y'all being here, guys. Chaos the Filthy said, hey, man, I want a young stud at safety, bro. Can we get somebody? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think we could use an impact player, but scouting department's going to have to put its thinking cap on, and these, this coaching staff's got to develop these guys too. That's part of it too. Jay Milton from New Jersey said, "Chaos, no doubt. We are due for a stud back there. Haven't had one since Doc left. I, I would, I would say Malcolm Jenkins was a stud. I mean, he was more. He wasn't a free. He was more of a strong in Philly, but the dude was an impact player, no doubt about it. But yeah, I think we need an impact player." Schlock, I don't know how to say your that last name, man. What is up, man? He said, love the live streams. Watching from India, got into the NFL in 2017 season. Became an Eagle fan since the beginning. Was gifted with a magical season that year. It's a good time to become an Eagle fan, that's for sure. You, you definitely caught the uh, crazy roller coaster ride at the right time. India, wow. What's up, Drew? Yeah, childhood, all athletes seem larger than life. Yeah, Drew, I always thought, like, because I was so young, you know, like I said, I was like, we're talking about like late elementary, early middle school. You know, I just thought Eric Allen was like this six foot one, six foot two corner. And then like as an adult, I look back and I'm like, dang, he's only like five foot ten, man. I don't know why. Like, it's crazy. But he felt like he was this huge freaking athlete to me. Spike 23 said, what's up, Gabe? How you doing, Spike 23? Appreciate you being here. Drew Johnson said, it was special. <laughs> 
Spike 23 said Lido and Brown was nice. Yeah, I mean, just the crazy nature of how good those early Jim Johnson secondaries were and just how spoiled we were, man. I mean, for like, it was crazy that at one point we had four corners that were, three of those four corners were going to, to become pro bowlers. You know, you had Troy Vincent. We had, uh, we had Troy Vincent, Bobby Taylor, Lido Shepard, Sheldon Brown. And I think Al Harris was actually part of one of those teams. I, that's crazy, man. To me, that's just such a crazy production level. Chalk it up, Sports Philly said, for me growing up, it was all about Lito Shepard, Sheldon Brown, and Asante Samuel. Yeah, you, you looks like you kind of came in those mid-2000 eras. Romy One More says, I agree 100% with Bobby Taylor and Troy Vincent. They were so incredible, Romy One. And like I said, I was a little young for the Roy Nell Young and the Herman Edwards years. Like, that was really before my time, so I can't really judge it like that. But from what I can remember, and I was definitely old enough to judge the Mark McMillan, you know, the, the Mark McMillan tandem kind of, I, it's hard to say, man, because like Bobby, so Eric Allen and Mark McMillan were a really good tandem. But the problem was, like I said, they were a little shorter. And th there were teams that took advantage of the height discipline issue. Sam, the artist formerly known as S. 4L said, right there with you, became a fan in 2001 at like 14 years old, watching Brian Dawkins, Bobby Taylor, and Troy Vincent. It was an incredible, it was an incredible group of guys in the secondary. It really was. Drew Johnson said, Lito was one of my favorites. Lito Shepard's always going to be a, a what could have been for me, just because the skill set was there and then he suffered the injury. And then like he had, like he, it took him a little while to come back from it. Then I remember he had the one real special game coming back. Uh, this was when T.O. left the team. I think it was like in the 2006 season. I think T.O. had left the team. He had come back to Philadelphia, and, and Lito locked him down. I remember that. Like, that was – it's been a while ago. <laughs> but I do remember that. And, like, he had that one, like, crazy, crazy productive season to, to kind of go back on and talk about again. Drew Johnson said Asante was a ball hawk. He jumped routes a lot. Yeah, he did. Uh, Drew, what I remember about Asante was just he was so incredible in short zones. When you do that short zone stuff, the so short zone just basically means anything. It's 10 yards and in front of you. If you put him in a situation where he's just reading the quarterback's eyes and he's playing the flats and someone tries to hitch on him, they try to run a quick out route on him. And they gave, you know, you know, they gave Asante permission to basically play palm coverage, which is to jump routes on the outside. He was incredible. He was absolutely incredible at doing that. I still think to this day he was the best person, best athlete I've ever watched in short zone, to be quite honest. Beachhead said, what do you think of Kayvon Wallace? Uh, truth be told, I don't have a ton of thoughts on Kayvon Wallace because he hasn't played a whole lot. I thought at Clemson, he looked like more of a strong safety than a free safety to me. He arrives in Philadelphia last year, and we play him a lot at free. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I thought he was a little bit limited as an athlete at Clemson, and there was a – I can't remember who it was. It was one of the running backs from Georgia got him in the open field real, real good in college. And it was pretty obvious that, like, his, he had some limitations you know, as an athlete, like he's just not, he's not dynamic, but he's tough. He's a tough kid. I thought he'd make a really good, strong safety, a box player. And I think he's definitely a pretty good matchup on, on tight ends. If he's athletic enough to stick there, but I, you know, the injuries and stuff have kind of kept him to where we can't really analyze on beachhead. So I don't know. I mean, he could be far better than we realize. And it's just a matter of getting him on the field and, and, and getting reps so we, we can see him actually play. I'm hoping he gets an opportunity this Saturday night against Dallas to get some reps in there. And I'm hoping Dallas does play, you know, their guys. So that way we can judge some of these guys against adequate competition and see where they actually rank instead of the, the backups. The backups, it's just really hard to judge guys. Like, you know, too much of that can be due to the competition you're facing. You know what I mean? I am Jim Ruiz. said, what's going on, my man, Gates? Fly, Eagles fly from the 856. Appreciate you, buddy. Appreciate everybody tuning in today. Uh, while I'm waiting for some of your comments to come in, just want to talk about you know, one of the people who have kind of teamed up through affiliate links with the channel with Gate City Sports Media. A lot of you guys, I'm going to keep saying this. So, I, you know, you guys have the information, <laughs> you know, it's out there. A lot of you guys keep asking me, look, Gate, I'm out of town. I don't I don't have access to local media, so I cannot watch the Eagles game the same way that other people can in South Jersey, Eastern Pennsylvania, Philadelphia and, you know, Delaware, Northeast Delaware. You know, how do I get around? You know, how do I get around this problem? There are some ways to get around the problem that cost you any money, but I can't say that on TV like this, well, on the internet like this. Uh, but there is a legitimate way of getting around it, which is to get a VPN network, right? VPNs do more than just secure 
all your data. I, you know, look, all those things are great and everything, guys. I'm not, I'm not discounting that VPNs do that. And it's a great feature to have. However, what I'm trying to tell you, what I use a VPN for is very simple. VPNs allow me to choose where I want to actually be seen from, right? Where my router is coming in from, where, where it gets identified from. So what I'm able to do with a VPN is to actually signal that I'm in Europe. So then if I'm watching Netflix, I'm getting everything that's in Europe that may not be on the American one anymore. But more importantly, with NFL Game Pass, I can get a European membership. I got to buy it, so I have to have an American and a European one, but I think it's worth it. Because with that membership, if you have the European membership, guys, what you can do with the VPN if you download it to your router is that VPN gives you access to buy that because it looks like you're coming in from England. Mine looks like I'm coming in from Leeds, England. And then basically what you're able to do there is, is because you have an account with them, they give all the European accounts, get the NFL game streamed to them with their membership. So you can get the games legitimately streamed to you with that membership. So that's a workaround, guys. Just for all y'all to keep asking me that, that's a really easy workaround. And if you want to know information, you can hit me up in it. If you just need the link, it's down below. You'll see where it says NordVPN. That's the link to get you to that. You just got to set it up on your router, guys. And then you buy an account in Europe. You can stream the games for free. And you get access to the coaches film, which is the added benefit. And they have a better interface than the American one. Oh, Dizzle Drizzle. What's up, man? He said, my all-time uh, defensive secondary. Give me Slay as one. Bobby Taylor as two. And Troy Vincent in the slot. Dawkins at free safety. And Malcolm Jenkins at strong safety. I don't know if I'd put Troy Vincent in the slot. Troy Vincent was a big dude. He's like 6'1-ish, 200 pounds. But I definitely like, you know, Slay and Bobby Taylor and Troy Vincent as a 1-2-3 combo there. You know, those, that's, those are three really good players. Troy Vincent is just so fundamentally sound. Bobby Taylor was such a physical presence that there's, you know, you try to put him on a guy that's physical, you know, just trying to push and get handsy with you to get separation. And Bobby Taylor had the physicality to push back. You know, not you don't find a lot of Bobby Taylors in the NFL. You know, it's just the way it is. Uh, Sam, the artist formerly known as S4L, said, I just wanted to toss out there that you're unlike any other analyst out there. Fan interaction is better than anyone else. Thank you, man. I appreciate that, Sam. Appreciate that a lot. I do the best I can, guys. I mean, I'm not going to say that I'm always perfect on things, but I try to do the best I can to actually answer your questions. And if I'm, if I'm going to push a product on you, I try to actually push a product on you that's useful <laughs> and then maybe answer some questions you guys are asking me. Austin Rochelle, don't know what that means, man. I appreciate you uh, watching. Beachhead said, does it have to be a router or can it be a modern uh, uh, modem provider by your a ISP? You can use your ISP. You can use your ISP, Beachhead, but here's the problem with your ISP. Then you have to download the VPN to each of the devices you're using, right? So you have to download it to your laptop, to your cell phone, where if you just do it to your router, if you just download it to your, rou your router, then you don't have to do each individual one. Everything connects to the router would be covered by it and would do it. So, you know, your smart TV, your laptop, your cell phone, all those things, you know, your iPad, whatever you have, you know what I mean? Like everything would be connected to it, but you can definitely connect individual pieces. It is kind of hard. I had to do it on mine through an ISP. I had to basically walk the ISP. So I had to take it offline essentially and then basically run it into a, a third party, you know, router, which is what I did. Um, I can give you some tips on how to do that, guys. If you get stuck with that, I'll tell you how I did it. I'm certainly not a professional, but I had to figure it out myself, too. But it's, it's definitely worth it, guys. It's worth it to get the coach's film, the better interface for the coach's film from Europe because the American interface sucks. And then you also get to see the games. They're, they're, they get the game. They get access to the games for free, which I think is a really unfair advantage. Like, easy. What's up, man? How are you doing? He said, what about Asante? Asante's on the list, man. Uh, I talked about Asante Samuel. Asante Samuel, I did them kind of chronologically, liaising. So, like, I, um, you know, I started off talking about Herm Edwards and, you know, Roy Nell Young, the guys from the 70s and 80s. Then I talked about, you know, I just kind of – I walked down the list in a chronological order. So I went from Herm Edwards to Roy Nell Young to Eric Allen to Mark McMillan, Bobby Taylor, Troy Vincent, Lido, Sheldon, and Asante. Um, I kind of did it in that order, in that fashion, so that would be easy for everybody to kind of follow. Asante, like I said, I think Asante Samuel is is the best short zone corner I've ever watched play football. He was such a tremendous, you know, playmaker, forcing fumbles, picking, you know, picking off passes. Like, I mean, the dude was just crazy, crazy athletic in that way. And was just, he was such a playmaker. Like, like I said, I look at guys in into categories is how I lump them in my mind. And like, when I look at him, I think of very distinct categories. I think of, you know, Asante Samuel, 
Lito Shepard, and Eric Allen. They all had very physical body statures, 5'10 ish, 185 to 195 pound ish. And they were all, you know, I don't know about Eric Allen being a short zone player. I'd have to really watch film from that era. But I do remember Asante being exceptional in short area. But all three of those guys were really good at taking the football away and forcing fumbles. They were definitely, you know, playmakers. Why, when I look at guys like, if I look at a guy like, you know, Darius Slay, I think more like Troy Vincent. You know, I think more like Roy Nell Young and, and, you know, like Herman Edwards, like that era of football guys, like the taller guys. Well, if I think about a dude like Mark McMillan, like, you know, you're talking about shorter guys. Like you're talking about um, Alexander out there in Minnesota, you know, uh, and then Jair that's out in uh, Green Bay, the shorter guys, right? Avante Maddox, who played a little bit on the outside, the shorter kind of outside corners that can play inside, outside. You know, I kind of lump them in my head that way. Then, you know, you talk about, like I said, uh, you know, Bobby Taylor, the only person I can even think to compare Bobby Taylor to is Richard Sherman, because you're talking about a six foot three, 215, 220 pound corner, man. You just don't, you don't find those dudes too much anymore. Like Bobby Taylor was just completely different physically. He's just a different type of player. Beachhead said also, can it be a, a modem router combo if I were to do away with my wireless modem provider for uh, by my I, ISP? Yeah, there's some there's different ways you can do it, Beachhead. Yeah. Um, what you could do with your ISP is just go, like go on YouTube and then like search for how to walk your ISP to a third party router. And it'll show you how to do it. You got to go into your settings inside, you know, your ISP and to basically change it. Chaos the Filthy said, I agree, Sam. I'm Jim Ruiz said, man, I must say it's really going to be hard to get Howie out of here after what he's done this offseason. It's going to be almost impossible, man. He's probably getting a contract extension. I don't think there's any doubt about that at this point. Um, I will say, like, I hope we can rebuild the cornerback room because although I think we've had this one really good season of corner play, right? Like outside of the, the crazy crap that happened earlier in the year where we were just giving teams, affording teams entirely too much cushion to, to complete 80 percent passes against us of their passes. Um, when you do away with that aspect of things, like, I mean, Darius Slay has just been incredible this season. Avante Maddox has had a heck of a year. Steven Nelson has been, eh, Steven Nelson. <laughs> like, I'm not going to say Steven Nelson has been the worst corner we've had. That's for sure. He's been better than a lot of dudes recently. So, you know, I think you could definitely upgrade over Steven Nelson, but, you know, I, I definitely think he's, he's helped put together a pretty good, you know, a pretty good room, to be quite honest. <laughs> Jay Melton said, what about putting Asante in the slot in that starting lineup you just mentioned? I don't hate, Jay, I don't hate that Jay Milton. You could, I mean, I don't know, you know, if we're just talking about like whether or not the guys agree with being put in the slot or not. Sure. Like, absolutely. He could play the slot. He was, he was twitchy enough. You know, you gotta have number one, you gotta be tough as nails, which I do think that even though he was lighter, he was tough as nails. Asante was, uh, but number two, you need to be kind of a, a short area athlete, right? You gotta be twitchy. And I, I definitely think that just like his son, it's the type of athlete he was. I think he could absolutely do it. Uh, Romy One More said, do you think McPherson could be like Sheldon Brown? I don't know, Romy One More. I mean, what I remember about Sheldon Brown was the physical nature of him, but I hear what you're saying in terms of if the eye discipline, if the eye discipline improves, could he be like Sheldon Brown where Sheldon Brown had really good timing on passes, good pass breakup guy, really good interception guy? Could McPherson with more eye discipline, more experience, more time to develop, become that type of guy? Possibly. I don't, you know, it's, it's been so long ago. I remember that Sheldon Brown was not the most dynamic athlete in terms of speed, foot speed. Uh, McPherson's not as well, but I, I, I think McPherson's a little bit more of an athlete, a little, little better athletic. I know that some people don't, don't know that about McPherson. He's not like a crazy four, three guys, a little bit more towards that four or five area, to be honest. But, um, I do think McPherson was a slightly better he's, he's a slightly better athlete than what Sheldon Brown was. But to be honest with you, it's been so long ago. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you, you have rose colored glasses or or time can deceive what you what you believe about a guy. <laughs> I'm Jim Reese said the one guy I didn't want to leave our team was Russell Douglas. Believe it or not, I made a video back in 2020, or before the 2020 season. And I talked about Russell Douglas and I talked about, you know this Eagle secondary. And, and I, and I knew that somebody was going to get axed. I knew somebody was going to get axed out of these guys. And I said, it really depends if we're going to go into a zone system. I think Russell Douglas is the fit. You know, if we went into a more of a man system, you know what I mean? Like I just, I was kind of looking at it and I said that we might have one of the underrated secondaries. It turned out to not be true because we did away with both of those guys 
And then we just, you know, outside of just having Darius Slay, we had a big problem on our hands. But, yeah. Leezy said Bobby would be a safety in today's game. I don't know, man. Uh, you got you got to remember, it's hard to be a safety, and, like, Richard Sherman wasn't a safety, and he's very much like a Richard Sherman type. Um, I don't know that he would be a safety because you have to have kind of lateral quickness, side-to-side -side quickness. I don't know. Like, it's hard to remember that area, Leezy, to say that, say Woody would or – or wouldn't be because I, I don't have like numbers in front of me to analyze his lateral speed and his lateral lateral ability. But you got to remember safeties have to be short area guys, short area quickness guys. And they also need to have that, you know, that lateral speed element to them. So I'm not too sure that's him because, you know, if you're a strong safety, you still want, la you still want short area quickness because you're going to come down to cover tight ends and stuff. Now it doesn't need to be to the level of a nickel corner, but yeah, it's kind of hard, man. It's definitely kind of hard. Drew Johnson said it's a spammer. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. <laughs> pretty sure you're right, sir. No doubt about it. Beachhead said, looking back at it now, is Howie really that bad at drafting? I think it was more development, like you said. Um, look at guys like Davion Taylor, TJ Edwards, Quez Watkins, Maddox, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, look, I, you know, I, I wasn't saying that, you know, to be fair, Beachhead, I don't want to take credit for something like that. Like I said that, how, like to put it in context of the way I said it. I said, I think Howie in the front office is banking on that the issue was not necessarily completely in the draft. It was more so in player development. Now, I, I'm not saying that I necessarily whole, whole, wholeheartedly agree with that. I think it was a little bit of both, right? I think Howie has a perspective and a point that some of the, you know, Doug's coaching staff was just horrible at developing guys. And that has to be factored into the equation. But the other side of it is like, it is kind of hard to justify not taking DK Metcalf, but I will say this. I don't think we passed on DK Metcalf because Howie Roseman looked at, J you know, Howie Roseman in the scouting department looked at J.J. Ortega Whiteside and said, this dude's a better prospect. I don't think that's what happened. I think the medical staff failed. I think the medical staff said, like, stay away from him because of the injury to the neck. They thought the neck injury was too severe and that, you know what I mean, like that. I will say that Howie has to get better at deciding between coaches, analytics, and scouts. That's the three areas that influence your draft board. And uh, a great example of that is, is that the coaching staff, I know everyone keeps saying it was Howie, it wasn't Howie. The coaching staff was who was on Jalen Rager. The scouting department was on Justin Jefferson. One of the coaches came out and told Howie and made the argument that Justin Jefferson would be solely a slot guy. Doesn't take too much imagination to figure out which coach that was, who coaches the position. They were there that year and they're there this year. Um, that, that person made that statement. Won the won the room over with that statement, and then said, "Look, if you go back and you film, you see the film." And I'll admit, Jalen Rager's film in college was quite good, although it was quite inconsistent. And I was a big Rager guy, but even I kept pushing back and saying, "As big as a Rager guy as I am, and I and I love Rager's college film." I said, "Justin Jefferson is a better player." I made two videos trying to get people like, "Hey, man, I, I like Aaron Moorhead. I have nothing against Aaron Moorhead, but the guy that I'm assuming made those made those statements, and I don't know it to be fact, guys, but that's what it sounds like to me." I disagree with him. I'm looking at Justin Jefferson's film. This guy's head fake is next level. What he, I made a video where I talked about his eyes and the way he used his eyes to manipulate corners. It was next level, man. You just don't see that from college players. And this young man did this going back to high school, and this was not a highly recruited guy. There was a, a, a piece of film floating around. It's on that video I did about Justin Jefferson, if you go back to 2020 draft profiles, to where he was in this high school camp. And he's got the, he got, he had a corner. I can't remember what corner it was, but it was definitely a highly rated corner that was covering him. I mean, he absolutely took him to school on an out and up. I, I mean, it was all over. I mean, so, I mean, he was like this all the way going back to high school. And I tried to warn that I loved Jalen Rager's film and I loved Jalen Rager's fit with Doug Peterson. Justin Jefferson was the better player. <laughs> you know, just, you know, film never lies. And I was, I was on Jalen Rager back in December of 2019. I, you know, I, started watching his film and I said, I like this guy a lot. You know, I didn't anticipate he was going to have this kind of mental lapses in, in issues with the city. You know, and I think that's part of the, the problem here with Jalen Rager. I don't necessarily think it's talent level, but he's just not, you know, he's not owning up to the fact that he needs to be better versus man press. He's too strong to be getting jammed at the line of scrimmage the way he's getting jammed. He's not playing to how strong this kid is. It's, it's, it's a little ridiculous to be honest. Like Jalen, Jalen Rager is better than what he's putting the film out on, but at a certain time, you know, you can't wait for shifts that don't come in. Like, you either got to start beating man press coverage and getting getting open. I mean, he's good against off coverage. Like, there are times you run the film and Rager gets open versus off coverage and he doesn't get the football. 
probably because of the, the nature of the design of the play. But still, like, you know what I mean? Like, he's got to get better, man. Like, I tried to warn people about it. I saw it on film. I, yeah, I, I thought, like, me being an ambassador, a guy that was really high on Rager and telling people, like, yo, Justin Jefferson is the right pick. Maybe that would get the fan base. Because I thought the Eagles were going to pick Justin Jefferson. But, yeah, man, that, that went down a way that I was not uh, anticipating going down. Oh, Dizzle Drizzle said, question, Gates, which player do you want to see this Saturday take advantage of reps and game tape while starters sit? Me, McPherson, Kayvon Wallace, Jacoby Stevens, and, and Gainwell? That's a great question. It's a really good question. Uh, I'll say this. I, I would love to see the young secondary play. Kayvon Wallace is definitely one that's pretty high on my list that I want to see play. McPherson, absolutely, because we spent a fourth-round pick on him, so I want to see how he plays against better competition. And then also I will say that Tay Gowan, you know, Tay Gowan's kind of an intriguing guy in terms of the, the profile, but he doesn't have a ton of playing experience in terms of high-level competition. You know, Tay Gowan played at UCF, which even at UCF for the one year he played there, that's not a high-level competition. And then you take UCF out of the equation, he opted out of the 2020 season, so you have to deal with the opt-out portion of what happened. And then he was transferring in from a community college in 2019 or 2018 to 2019 season. So, I mean, like he just hasn't played a ton of high level football. So I don't know where he is in his development. So seeing him on the field, playing the majority of a game in its snaps would be interesting. Kerry Vincent Jr. I don't know if they'll play him, but Kerry Vincent Jr. is a very versatile guy that can play safety, nickel, outside corner. You know, he's interesting guy to watch outside of Kerry Vincent Jr. I would say that um, there's a few different guys you could look at. Uh, Josiah Scott, you know, he's a shorter guy. He's not a big guy. He's a Mark McMillan type. Good short zone, though. He's got the Asante Samuel aspect of being a really good short zone defender to where he'll come up and, and break up passes and, and take an interception from – he'll take the ball from a guy. So, I mean, like, you know, seeing different guys kind of in their roles playing. You know, uh, Shashere has been playing as the nickel. I don't – you know, it'd be interesting to see who they play as the starting nickel in this scenario. Shashere, Kerry Vincent Jr., would they consider bouncing Josiah Scott inside? I, I don't know. Mike Smith said he's too little to be Brown. No, I don't think he's talking about the physical stature. And got to remember, Sheldon Brown wasn't that tall. Sheldon Brown was just big in terms of, like, the build. Um, but Sheldon Brown, you know, I think he's talking about the fact of, like, how Sheldon Brown got better and better with the eye discipline aspect. And then Sheldon Brown became exceptionally good at reading quarterbacks and finding ball location and either deflecting passes for pass breakups or, or coming down with the interception. I think that's more what he was talking about, Mike, about, like, can he be, you know, can McPherson's game develop more into that? Which I, you know, to be honest with you, I don't know. Like the bigger issue with McPherson's college film was, is that he, he lacked high discipline. He good enough quarterbacks can manipulate him. Maybe Lito. No, he's not Lito's level of athleticism. Um, Lito and Asante and, you know, guys like, you know, just that, that generation and that, that style of football player, like, Eric Allen and Lito Shepard and Asante Samuel, all those guys are just, they were different. Like he's the same height, five foot 10 ish, but he's not the same type of athlete as those guys. Those guys were far better athletes. Uh, Drew Johnson said, I think they should bring up Huntley and or carry on this Saturday. I think they're going to probably have to. I mean, just judging from what's going to happen with the C19 list, and who knows? I mean, guys still have time to get back. But judging what happens with the C19 list and the fact that Miles Sanders isn't right. Jordan Howard shouldn't play. Hopefully you get Boston Scott back and you got Kenneth Gainwell. So you probably only need one of those guys to come up if you can get those two guys in the games. But yeah, man, you know, it's Drew. I agree with you, man. Like <laughs> I think something definitely has to happen there. Lizzie said, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. It's, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of information back behind it, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy, man. It's, it's, it's crazy how, how much the league has changed, right? Because I think the biggest issue we'd have with a guy like Bobby Taylor in today's game is, is that if you're not technically sound as a big dude, if you get handsy and fight back in today's NFL, the rules are different. You know what I'm saying? You're probably going to get flat. So I don't know how successful Bobby Taylor, because Bobby Taylor had like ridiculous pass defense numbers when he was a player. And he, you know, you're talking about the Michael Irvin era to where you could get physical with dudes. I ain't too sure that era of football exists anymore. So I'm not too sure that it would, necessarily line up again but I would love to see that style of player again you know Richard Sherman type that's just so technically sound doesn't have great foot speed it's not about being a foot speed it's about taking staying in phase with the receiver and understanding that okay if if I have coverage then it's not about 
It's about making sure I'm reading the person's hips and I'm not reading their feet and I'm not reading their shoulders. I'm certainly not reading their eyes. Like you don't really need to read the eyes until you're looking for the ball. Like that's when you turn it and look for the ball. But you know, the era of football is so different, man. It just, it's a completely different game now. I'm Jim Marie said, Oh my goodness. Edwards is really becoming a real linebacker. I would still get one in the first round and a safety, but man, Oh man, Edwards has really impressed me. I'll be honest with you. I'm Jim Ruiz. I was not a big Edwards guy at the very beginning. Meaning when we first signed him as an undrafted rookie free agent, it was the first year. I think I started my YouTube channel and there was so much fan buzz around the fact that this is a Wisconsin guy. And, uh, you know, I was like, I don't know, man, you know, I know the big can produce linebackers, but you know, I wasn't sure about him being athletic enough to play on the field and, and, and to be that style of athlete and things like that. But then like I started watching him, man, and he got in that Buffalo game and it's what, the 2019 season where he got into the Buffalo game in that, in that windy game. You guys remember that one where the wind gusts were like something crazy, like 30, 40 miles per hour. And it was just this running game. And man, the way that he flowed to the football from the linebacker spot was something I had not seen in a really, really long time. And he just completely won me over. That's when I became like, you know what? There's something to this young man. And then I, like, I kept projecting him to stay on the roster. And then this year I said, you know, what's also not really known about him. And I made a video and everyone was like, wow, Kate, I didn't realize that was his numbers and coverage. I said, you know, this is a former safety. He's not good in man coverage, right? He just doesn't have fluid enough hips for man coverage to do that. But what I kept trying to tell people is he's underrated in zone coverage because, because he played safety. He just has a really good knack for where the depth is supposed to be from a zone coverage situation. And that was something like I kept trying to tell people like, man, if you watch him in zone coverage, guys, he's better than the rest of these linebackers. I don't know what all these other people are not seeing. Like I'm seeing film and this kid standing out. And then this season, he finally proved me right with that where he, he started taking the ball away. And I was like, Oh man, like this young man starting to put it together. Like this is looking like a guy that could be a starter for a few years. Like this is an incredible journey for an undrafted rookie free agent that, I mean, there was questions that the young man was going to make the football team to being what he is today, which is just a really productive player and great in run defense underrated as a zone defender from the passing game, limited in terms of man coverage. Still though, man, you know, I, I like him a lot. I, I'm, a, I'm a really big fan of TJ Edwards. He's one of my favorite players on this Eagles team. Showing up 215. What's up, buddy? How you doing, sir? I appreciate you tuning in today. What's up, Lindy Inzone? How are you doing today? Oh, Dizzle Drizzle, he said uh, Parsons is out Saturday. Yeah, I kind of saw that too to where something was going on with Parsons. Heavy feeling McCarthy pulls his starters mid-second quarter and Mustache Man has a big gain to beat the Cowgirls. Uh, I'll ask you guys this, though. Do you even think that we're going to play – do you think we're going to play Minshew the whole game? I have my doubts that they're going to expose Minshew to, to potential injury, you know, because it being the playoffs coming up, you know, I just don't know there's a whole lot to play for. You know what I mean? Like, I think that this might be one of those games where maybe you play Minshew for a quarter or a half and then you bring in Reed Sinek. This might be the Reed Sinek game at the second half of the game. This might really feel like a preseason game, to be honest, by the time it's all it's all said and done. I'm all good for it. You know, I, I would be mad if I had tickets, but, you know, I'll still watch just to see the development of the players, you know, see where some of these guys are at. But, you know, obviously it wouldn't be the most entertaining <laughs> of games for sure. I mean, yeah, I'm Jim Reese. I remember. Yeah, man. I mean, I just – it was crazy because there was some fan buzz around them. I mean, there were people that legitimately liked them. Uh, I was a little skeptical on him, but then I just, you know, after I saw the Buffalo game, Jim Reese, he, he changed my opinion on him. I was like, yeah, there's something to this. Like, I know good film when I see good film, and maybe it would just be a one-game hit wonder thing, but uh, I think he's worth taking a shot on. <laughs> Show enough 215 said, a linebacker in the first round would be a waste, well, to a degree. We don't know who will be defensive coordinator next season. However, in a different scheme – the linebackers will look different, still get one, not in the first. Um, I, I, I don't think we're going to have a different defensive coordinator showing off. I think it's still going to be Jonathan Gannon. I mean, there's a chance that he gets hired away by somebody, but I doubt it. I don't think he's quite ready to be a head coach yet. I mean, the only oddball ch- situation here is that whatever familiarity he has with the Minnesota Vikings organization, that they take a shot on him because, you know, it's better to get guys a year or two before too early, especially if you're in an organization that may not be the most desirable to go to. It's better to take a chance on a guy a couple of years too early than to be waiting when you know that window opens for that guy and then you just can't you can't compete organizationally for him. But 
my gut feeling is is that Jonathan Gannon is going to be defensive coordinator here again next year. That's you know that's what it feels like to me, man. Is that he's got limitations? He's got to get better at. I wouldn't say they're limitations. It's not the right way of, of saying it. Showing up, my bad. I'll say that uh, he's got some areas of his defense that, from a play calling standpoint, doesn't make sense yet. And I I, I get that he's not like I'm not I'm not one of these guys calling for people to be fired. So enough, you know me well enough to know that's not really my style. But what I will say is, is that the last drive of the Washington game summarized the problem with Jonathan Gannon, early play calling so far. And that at times where it's such a common sense situation to be aggressive on a third and long, you allow a team to sit back, look through all their reads at a quarterback to, to easily make that completion. And that that's, that's the problem. Like there, there's, you, you have to bring pressure there. I just, I don't know what he was thinking. I, you know, I have no clue what he was thinking. Like I said, he's a young guy. I'm not going to say that he's never going to turn into anything. Like we've given up on guys too soon before. We've definitely done that in particular defensive coordinators where we ran them out of town and they turned out to be exceptionally great defensive coordinators. And I think we made a mistake with one of them who's now the coach of Buffalo. But, you know, I guess in fairness, he wasn't going to be in Philadelphia for long anyways. He was never going to be the successor to Jim Johnson because that guy was going to go on to bigger and better things anyways. So I guess you can say, yeah, it's spilt milk. No, no, no sense in worrying about that. But you guys get what I mean. Like we gave up on him clearly too soon. Chalk it up, sports. Philly said, "My man Gates, we got to put in some work." I hear you, bro. Appreciate you, man. Definitely hit me up. Ted Nicholas, what's up, man? How you doing, Ted? Said, just curious. Are you concerned that we haven't beaten anyone with over a 500 winning percentage? Happy New Year, Coach. What's up, Ted? Happy New Year to you, man. I hope everything went well. Uh, yes and no. Ted, I don't know how good we are, <laughs> simply put. You know, I have no clue how good this team is or is not. Uh, defensively, it does concern me a little bit because we've seen great success at times with Jonathan Gannon. And to be fair, Jonathan Gannon's defense has kept us in games at times. That's the other side of the story, like where Gannon has kind of kept us around in games when the offense was stuttering. But at the same time, he gives up points so much. 11 out of 17 games, he's given up touchdowns in the first quarter. So we're putting the offense in kind of rough territory to operate from early in games. That's why if I was if I was Nick Sirianni, I would stop deferring to halftime because of the way that things are kind of going. Like this is a time where we don't need to be being taken out of what we do. So, I mean, I would probably – if I'm winning the, the toss, I'm probably taking the football offensively. But I don't know how good we are. I will say this. I mean – you can look at the Denver game and say, well, Denver ended up slipping down the stretch. But when we played Denver, they were red hot. Now, they, they suffered some, some things to their team. Their, some of their best defensive players got, got knocked out of that game. So they couldn't really, you know, they, they were a little limited defensively. But with that said, Vic Fangio is a really good defensive coordinator. That's a really good defense there in Denver. And, you know, I mean, at the time we played them, they were pretty red hot, man. They had just beat down Dallas. So, I mean... You know, that was a good win. You know, the New Orleans game was a good win. I do believe New Orleans is 500. So that's one team. I think that kind of, you know, ranks in that area. I will say that, you know, the team has been very impressive on the road. You know, six and three with a rookie head coach and a rookie defensive coordinator on the road is really difficult to do. That speaks volume to the veterans in the locker room that, you know, you're going on the road and you win six out of nine games on the road, man. That says something like the veterans, you know, they shined in this season in my opinion. So, I mean, I don't know how good they are, Ted. I mean, we won't know until we see them line up again against you know, one of these playoff teams and see if they're competitive, to be honest. Mad Hatter. What's up, Mad Hatter? How you doing, man? Said this is a good game for young guys. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Chalk it up, Sports Philly. He said, uh, I had tickets to the game. They were a gift from my wife, but still great to go for the last game. I love the link. Yeah, chalk it up sports. I hear you, bro. I would still go too. Um, I, I would definitely go personally if I was you. But yeah, it kind of sucks, man. Like if it was a meaningful game and you had the last and it's Dallas, like, yeah, man, that could have been like magical, man. Chalk it up. It could have been like a magical kind of experience. I, I get it, man. That that still, you know, you'll get to see a lot of these young guys up close and give your opinion on like, hey, man, like, you know, from watching the game, being at the field and seeing like, you know, Kerry Vincent Jr. or seeing Tay Gowan or, you know, seeing McPherson up front and close, you know, like Hey man, there might be something there. So at least you'll get the opportunity to, to look at it from, from that perspective. Messiah, what's up, man? How you doing? He said, I can't wait to see the young guys play. 
it really shows us the depth we will have going into next year and how much uh, the, does the draft help or how much we're going to need <laughs> to spend in the draft and in free agency. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to let you know where you are as an organization and as a team. I get exactly what you're saying, Messiah, and I agree with that that perspective it's, it's very much true which is you know playing the better competition not not this week but the following week it's going to let you know where you are as an organization to an extent right where you need to make improvements it's going to give us the truth about the coaching staff and you know you know to some extent we do know something about the coaching staff i mean look we were predicted to have four wins you know people keep saying like oh you be bottom feeders but the people that are saying that are the fan bases of the teams that were the bottom feeders we were supposed to be the bottom feeders and we proved that we're not quite the bottom of the bottom feeders. We're more of the mid-tier guys. And I, I think that gets lost on people, Messiah. And I think you're absolutely right. Like, it, it just makes me laugh when I hear some of the, the people I know that are Washington fans and some people I know that are Giant fans. And I have a lot of people in the community that, you know, they come, they ask me my opinion on stuff. But then they'll say that about the Eagles. And I'm like, right. But, like, that only happened because your team was proven to not be what people thought. Like, and our team was proven to be better than what people thought. People, you know, kind of discounted how good our defensive line was, how good our offensive line was. People discounted how good Jalen Hurts would be, how far he would progress in terms of the season. So, I mean, you know, how good our coaching staffs would be, you know, it is what it is. Like, they, you know, you look at a guy like in New York, which it's crazy to me that the Giants may maintain, they may keep Joe Judge around. Like, dude, Joe Judge has been in the league for two years. Nick Sirianni's almost passed him. He has passed him in one year, maybe not in total wins. Nick Sirianni's taking the team to the playoffs already. First year in. Look, man, the Giants spent money. The Giants went after draft picks. They did a lot of stuff. How much does Joe Judge need to, to win? I think they got the wrong guy. And I don't hate you. I don't hate Joe Judge or anything. I just don't think he's the right guy. I, I, I think they're making a mistake. I think they should be in the I definitely think they should be in the market for a head coach. Backyards Birds Podcast. What's up, buddy? Said, hey, Gay, I have a, a pod with my boy Vic Three. Would you come do an episode with us? Check it out. The big ticket. Yeah, man. I know Vic three. He's, he's been a long term, long term member of the uh, battle birds podcast community. Yeah, guys, just hit me up, man. Jeremiah Butler. What's up, man? How you doing? Sorry, guys. <laughs> the chat jumped on me. No sooner. I was about to hit the button. <laughs> oh, Dizzle Drizzle said, chalk it up sports. What up, man? You're a lucky man to have a wife like that. Been throwing my wife hints 10 years to no avail. Shaking my head. Yeah, my wife didn't buy me tickets either. I had to basically take the incentive to and the initiative to go get the Carolina tickets this year. But she's pretty, you know, if I say, yo, let's go to let's go to Philly. We're going to a game. She'd be down for it. I'll give her credit for that. Mad Hatter said, it's funny that the Eagles and the Packers are the only teams that have nothing to play for. Yeah, it is, is interesting, right? That like we don't really control anything, honestly. Like we still need other teams to lose and scenarios to happen for any you know our seating to change but you know for green base perspective they've already clinched yeah it is weird i don't even really think dallas has much to play for dallas has this little minute chance little minute chance that uh they might be able to increase their seating i doubt it though like there's so many things that have to happen in order for them to go from the four seed to the two seed potentially they can go to the three seed but it's really not that big a deal <laughs> Backyard Birds podcast said Hamilton would be great to draft or that edge rusher from Michigan. Yeah, I mean, those guys are going to be hard to get there, though. You know, you'd have to really climb up into the draft and, and go after guys and target them. I think it's I think that's more of the issue there is, is trying to figure out how you're going to get up into the draft to target players of that extent. I think you're referring to Hutchinson as the defensive end. Those guys are probably potentially top five picks. I mean, you can make the argument that Hamilton being a safety is probably, you know, he might slide past the, the first five. But Nonetheless, you're going to have to climb the draft. I mean, it would definitely help if the Indy if Indy drops their game this weekend, and then now we got Miami and Indy's pick, and those two picks are going to both fall between 14 and 18. It gives you the arsenal if you want to move up and get a guy, or if you want to stay put and just stay and, and be able to select guys. I don't know that they're going to take three. You know what I mean? I have no clue if they'll take three guys. We'll, we'll have to see. Uh, the problem with taking three, you know, first round picks is the, is the cost of it. You know, simply put, you know, it's going to cost you 10 million, but then you you calculate you calculate in the rule of fifty one because you have to have fifty one men roster you know people on your roster anyway. So you subtract the league minimum salary. So you take seven hundred and I think it's like five thousand dollars. You multiply it by those three picks. It's like I don't know a little over two million dollars. So it costs you like I don't know seven point nine. You know anywhere between say six point five to seven point nine million dollars to sign three first round guys. Um, 
I would do it if the right guys are on the board personally. If the right guys are on the board, I, I think you pay that much money for first round picks. You know, then but you also gotta keep in mind that you're gonna come up on three separate guys that'll have fifth year options down the road. You're gonna be potentially paying fifth year options on three guys, unless you get contracts done before that. What's up, Antonio Holmes? How you doing, sir? The Melvin Brown experience said the Eagles gonna have a good draft class. I hope so, Melvin Brown. I definitely hope so. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of opportunity to get this right this year and to really build a core on the football team and to have an infusion of talent that we haven't had here in, in some time. It seems like zone defense is our Achilles heel. It's uh, it's the depth at which we play our zone, I think, is the, the problem, Ted, is that zone coverage in itself isn't, you know, like you, zone co- you, you run zone coverage for a reason. But – I think it's the depth we play on it. And I showed that, that if you filter by, I, I wrote an article guys. So go in the community section and you'll see that I made a post yesterday where I did a, uh, a poll. And on that poll, I was asking about, you know, the defense. I linked to an article I wrote. And in that article, I reference about the depth that our average, you know, depth of targets are occurring against our cornerbacks. It's the lowest in the NFL. And it has to do with the depth that we're playing our corners, the depth that we're playing our zone. So teams are just taking what we're giving to them and just converting into 80% completion rates from better quarterbacks, and they're just moving down the field at will. So, I mean, that, that's that's a big part of it, Ted, to be honest. Question, would you trade out one or two draft picks to move up in this year's draft? It, not not just not for the sake of just moving up, but, I mean, if the right player is there, right? It's, you know, if the right guy is falling down the board, you know what I mean? Like, I, I'd probably go get him then I'd probably trade it away. But it also depends on like who's still there, right? Like if I'm jumping one or two spots, I probably would make a trade. If I'm jumping eight spots, it might be harder to make that trade because you have to give up significant draft capital to move eight spots. Because if you're, you know, let's just say you're in the 16th pick and you're trying to jump to the eighth pick in the draft, that's going to cost you. It's, it's going to be quite expensive to do that. Yo, does everyone know that if in, it isn't a big if if Ward or Rager catches it versus the Giants and Gannon is aggress- aggressive against the Chargers on the last drive. We would be on a nine game win streak. Yeah, I mean, we had opportunities, right? I mean, I agree with what you're saying. There were definitely opportunities. If the defense gives the ball back to Jalen Hurts in the offense and Nick Sirianni, maybe I mean, you can't guarantee they would have won the game, but we would have had a, a, an opportunity there to have won that game, you know, against the Chargers. And then you're right. I mean, what happened against the Giants is, is kind of inexcusable. It should not have happened. And we probably should have definitely won those games. What's up, Jeremiah? How you doing, Jeremiah? Chalk it up sports said, uh, what's gate, what's your honest assessment of Jalen Hurst development so far this season? Uh, in terms, all right, if you want me to be critical about what I see from a film perspective and being a, a former quarterback and a, a quarterback coach, the deep ball has got to get better, man. He's, he's throws from a really bad, you know, base on his deep balls. There are times that you'll hear these things where they say heel clicky. It just means that he's, his feet are coming together too close together right before he delivers the football. Um, there are times that he does not throw the ball with really great ant- anticipation. I think he's honestly, I think what he's trying to do down there is instead of throw to a marker. So like, say you're, you're throwing towards the left hash mark, if you're on the left side, right? So you're going to throw to that left hash mark instead of doing something like that and driving the football with purpose. Jalen tries to put a little too much touch on the football and that causes the ball to kind of flutter there. And that's why people will say, like, oh, Jalen doesn't have a good arm. Like, no, he's got plenty of arm strength. Arm strength is not Jalen's issue. He's He's got to get better at anticipating and pushing the football. Uh, his base gets off. Like I said, the deep ball has got to improve from the base standpoint. I will say, overall, he's got to be a little better with throwing receivers open. And, and I thought we saw elements of that last week, like where I thought, like, oh, wow, like, this is good. This is really good to see on film. Like, I see some nuance to the young man's game right now. So he's got to develop and, and be a little bit more consistent with throwing receivers open instead of waiting for a receiver to break open. You kind of have to have that rapport with the guy that you have out there and then, you know, see where it goes. I think that it would be smart of the Eagles to keep playing Greg Ward Jr. Although he's not an explosive guy, he's not going to give you that type of offense. What he is good at doing is creating separation. And that's a guy that could really help Jalen Hurts develop that kind of rapport with somebody. And you could probably start seeing Jalen Hurts actually anticipate more and put the ball out there for him. Um, those are the things I think he really needs to work on. I think he's gotten so much better at reading coverage. I'm not saying that he's perfect. He still makes mistakes reading coverage, but I see drastic improvement there. He's getting a lot better. And we saw that in his explanation where he's 
clearly being coached up. And you see the, the aspects of being a coach's son come to life when he gave you that explanation of what happened on the goal line in that play, right? Where he's like, look, they're running cover seven. Like, you know, I can't anticipate that they're going to blow their coverage and Goddard's just going to be wide open in the corner. You know, they're, they're playing Meg down here on this receiver. I'm supposed to go to a man coverage beater versus this cover seven. Look, the, the problem was, is they were bracketing the inside, you know, receiver on the opposite side, which kept the safety right where I wanted to throw the ball. The only criticism I would give them on that is throw that ball with anticipation and maybe you have a shot at the end zone. Um, but I, I thought that his, he's gotten so much better at really reading coverage and understanding what's going on. I, I thought he's gotten a lot better. And I also think he's getting better at sliding the pocket. Uh, there were some times where he was definitely exiting the pocket too soon early in the season to where it was getting a little frustrating. Like, hey, man, you got to hang tougher in the pocket longer than this. And I do think that what we see now is a, a young man that's he's trying to look downfield. He's keeping his eyes downfield, which is quite impressive recently. I, I mean, to me, he looks like a guy that he's not quite there yet, but this is – He's as good a prospect as pretty much anyone else outside of, I'd say, Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert. Those are the only two guys I would elevate above him of the recent draft classes that I think right now, I'm not saying the other guys can't sur can't surpass him, but in terms of like what I'm seeing, you could put him in the conversations with the Zach Wilson who's not seeing the field well. Zach Wilson's got a great arm. He's a kid that will take risk, and, and he's got good ball placement, but he's got a tendency to overthrow the ball, and he gets picked. He's as good a prospect as Zach Wilson. He's as good a prospect as Tua. He's as good a prospect as Mac Jones. He's as good a prospect as Lance out there in San Francisco. You know, he's, he's as good a prospect as anyone else who's been drafted outside of those other two quarterbacks. So, I mean, I think that it was, you know, all things considered, I think Jalen Hurts has done a great job putting in the work in. And I think that, honestly, the coaching staff has done a great job putting work in. Jeremiah, what's up, buddy? <laughs> he was saying, what's up, Tone? Hurt season said, what's up, Gate? Doing well, man. How about you? <laughs> Chalk it off sports said, thanks, Odizzle. But it wasn't easy. She, <laughs> she turned me down so many times. That's funny, man. Jeremiah said, hit that like button, people, and sub up. Appreciate you, man. <laughs> Jason Williamson said, good morning, Steve. What did I miss, bro? Uh, we started off by talking about kind of the legacy of Philadelphia Eagles cornerbacks. I mean, we went over everything from like Herm, Herm Edwards to um, Roy Nell Young, all the way to Eric Allen and Mark McMillan to Troy Vincent and Bobby Taylor and Lido and Sheldon and Asante. And we, we kind of talked about, you know, Darius Slay is probably not quite to the Eric Allens and the Asante Samuels and, and you know, and players like that. But he's probably in that next group of guys to where he's just an incredible football player. And then we just kind of went into the comments section and we've been all over the place <laughs> in the comments. We've just basically been talking about everything. Hurt season. <laughs> Hurt season said Hurts is that guy, period. Of course, Hurt season is going to say that Hurts is the guy. <laughs> I agree with you, Hurt season. Like, it would be foolish for them to move off of Jalen Hurts right now. I, I, I can't see it happening. I mean, I'm not saying you can't upgrade over him. Like, of course, you know, Aaron Rodgers and those guys are upgrades. But, I mean, that's like, I mean, come on, anyone with any kind of football intelligence knows that. The problem is, is I'm not giving up three picks. To, you know what I mean? Like, one guy is not going to change the entire dynamic of this team. Like, the team is not in a place where that kind of that kind of move is going to advance you forward. So I think the better play is to actually build around this young man and at least give him next year to show you one more time, like, is there advancement in the group? Because if he starts playing the way he's playing at the back end of the season throughout the, the majority of next season, you got something. Like, I just, to me, that's the way I would approach it. You guys know what I'm going to tell you, though. I'd never try to make predictions of what the front office will do. Our front office is, is as unpredictable is any front office in the league. And that's, that's where I'll keep it at. You know, I know what I would do. I have no clue what they would do. Uh, Backyard Bird says, I think quarterbacks will rise before those guys come off the board. I think we should go. I think we should, could go up and get one of them. I mean, look, anytime that a, a quarterback gets picked in the top 12, especially in, in this type of draft class, that means a guy that's pretty good, like an Ahmad Garner or someone like that is going to keep sliding down the board. That is absolutely true. There will be guys that will slide as a result of that. Um, I think it's when it helps you when you have really heavy defensive line and offensive line drafts. So if you're looking for skill position players, I think that's where you can sneak a guy because they'll slide down the board. But, I, I you know, I, I have no clue where they're going to value some of these quarterbacks. It's so early in the process. Like, we probably won't have a really good idea until mid-March to where some of these guys' values are going to be. I mean, even think about it. Even going into, you know, the Matt Jones, you know, 
kind of situation in last year's draft. A lot of us knew that he was probably going to be a top 24 pick. But, I mean, I was like, look, people ask me, I said, I think he's going to be somewhere between 12 and about 24. You know, it was hard to narrow down, to be quite honest. And he went where I said, but that's a big disparity. Basically, what I'm saying is, is that he's not going to be one of those top tier guys, but he's going to be that next tier. Jay Milton from Jersey said, I think it's too hard for Dallas to jump Bucks because they lost to them. But Dallas has a better division record than them, and Bucks lost to the Rams. But I'm unsure of what Rams division record is. Yeah, I heard the scenario say that Dallas has like a it, – it's like 70% chance they're staying exactly where they're seated. <laughs> so it, just, it doesn't seem like it's worth it to me. Michigan has two, def, deep, two defensive ends that's going early, in my opinion, unless you plan – to get the best edge rusher in the draft, you can wait until the second to still draft a decent edge rusher. I think it just depends on the value of the pick, right? Where the value of the player is compared to your pick. And it just depends. Like, what do you think of it? Ojibo is more of a, a stand-up pass rusher, though. I mean, I think some teams will see him as a 34 rush linebacker. And then other people might see him more as a Sam, a guy that you can convert to a Sam. And if you're going to use him the way that Minnesota uses Anthony Barr, he could maybe be that type of guy. But – I think the Eagles would see Ojibo more as just a traditional hands in the dirt five technique defensive end. Personally, that's as I think they would see him as show sure enough, but I definitely think Ojibo is a guy that, you know, talking about Michigan could be interesting because I do think some teams will see him as a 34 edge rush at 34, like, you know, rush linebacker. I think other teams will see him kind of in that Minnesota role to where if you have a, a Sam linebacker that you're going to use as a rusher and then kind of guard the flats, he's got that kind of athleticism. I could see that role. I know we're kind of predicated on that. I just don't, I haven't seen, you know, we, we barely use Jannard Avery in that role. <laughs> He's pretty good at it. Um, and then the, you know, then you have guys that'll probably play him as a five tech. I just think that, you know, if I had to take my bet, if we had him probably be as a five tech. What's up, Kenzo Moore. How you doing, buddy? He said, sup gate. I think they uh, use the Colts and Finn's pick and kick theirs forward. It's possible. It's, it's very, very possible. Kenzo. Show enough said, uh, in my opinion, the secondary is the priority. I agree with you. I agree with your opinion. <laughs> um, there will be times when the pass rush won't get home, but those defensive backs have to continue to cover. I think the only thing that changes that is if someone unexpected starts to slide down the draft board, right? Like if you get a guy that starts to slide down the draft board, I could see the Eagles maybe changing their minds a little bit there. Show enough, but I agree with the overall point you're making. Like, sure, I, I agree with that. And I do think that they have to go early in a lot of phases of the defense. You know, I'm not saying that to go first round, but corner safety, you know, linebacker, defensive line. We need, we need all three. We need all three levels to be honest with you. <laughs> Showing up says secondary is priority. How ironic, especially since the topic of the video is we were, you know, the early discussion was about secondary and the, the legacy of the secondary here in Philadelphia. <laughs> Oh, Dizzle Drizzle said, let's get Gate City up, fellas. Hit that like button and subscribe. This man, Cerebral Green, <laughs> is on the is on of the best reporting on the Eagles. Appreciate you, man. Thank you, O'Dizzle. <laughs> Jeremiah's uh, seconding in the motion, I guess, and OD Jizzle. Uh, Drew Johnson said, I can't wait to see the improvements in Jalen next year. I, I, I'm I'm excited to see where he's at too, Drew. I, I mean, that's I think getting him into a playoff game against a, a defense that can match you, like a Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay is a tough defensive matchup if Jalen Hurts starts to look like he's looked over the last couple of weeks against a team like Tampa Bay there's something to be really really excited about I'm not projecting that's what's going to happen because I know some people are going to take it the wrong way it's not what I'm saying I'm just saying if he does that like how can you not be excited like I mean he's there are these little minor things that are coming out that you're seeing on the film now that show this young man is growing now, I talked about Al Harris a little bit, show enough, but I couldn't remember. I knew he was somewhere around the Bobby Taylor and Troy Vincent era, but I couldn't remember if we had Al Harris with Lito Shepard and Sheldon Brown, Bobby Taylor, Troy Vincent, if it was Al Harris. I couldn't remember, but I know he was in that time frame between the late 90s, early 2000s. Jason Williams said, thanks, Steve. No, I appreciate you guys. Jeremiah said, uh, smash that like button. It helps to expose the videos to others. Thank you, guys. I appreciate y'all so much, man. Hurt season said, does anybody here watch the YouTube channel uh, microphone? He basically makes content surrounding major events in the NFL, i.e. the AB situation and things like uh, biggest tragedy in the NFL dope channel. I think I've seen him once or twice. 
I think I've seen him once or twice, to be honest with you. Bird Gang 114. What's up, buddy? How you doing, man? Sorry, guys. I just saw a sack, uh, super chat here. Back your birds podcast with a $5 super chat said, thanks for your input and content, Mr. Steve Goat. Appreciate you, buddy. Thank you so much for the super chat, man. RJ Fletcher said, I think we should get a defensive end or an O-lineman or linebacker. I think they're going to target a lot of guys. I think it's going to go by, you know, anytime there's a possibility of an O-lineman, you know, the Eagles are always going to look at it and at least think about it. I don't know that they're going to go that direction, but, you know, Lane Dickerson in the second round last year, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but I definitely think that you'll see defensive linemen probably be targeted somewhere in the early part of this draft. I'm not saying it'll necessarily be the first round, but I definitely think somewhere between the first and third round, there'll probably be a D lineman that comes off the board. Uh, I definitely think that we could use safety help. We could use corner help. You know, we could use a linebacker. I mean, all those things are true. Antonio Holmes, it's going to be hard to move on from Hertz. He has that locker room leadership and production. Those are very good points. Uh, pro bowler and playoffs and first full season starting Hertz is the guy. I agree with that. You, the, for the reasons you're laying out for there, Antonio Holmes, I think that's a very good point that it becomes very, very difficult to then move off a player like that. I, I agree. It, it, it is very difficult to do that. It doesn't really matter what you think about him or not. It's just that when you run down the resume like that, it's, it's kind of hard as an organization. There are 32 people here. So I believe that there should be 32 likes. Let's go guys. Support the, my man Gates. Appreciate you guys. I think I seen it once or twice on accident in a hurt season, but thanks for the heads up. Yeah. I've watched him once or twice myself too, guys. If we beat Dallas and beat the Rams, I'm going all in on the NFC Championship game against whoever. <laughs> if we beat anybody, I'm going all in. <laughs> I hope we uh, – guard from Texas. Oh, carry on Green, the guard from Texas. Interesting. I haven't really had a chance to run his uh, film yet, Bergang 114. It's interesting. Though. I'll write him down and definitely take a look at him. Gate, what you think about this? Uh, the Miami pick, we take Leal. Our pick, we take Williams, the wide receiver. Colts pick, we take uh, the Utah linebacker. I mean, I don't know if things will work up in that degree in terms of, like, who would be available with those picks. If we walked away from the draft with those three players, I would be quite happy. RJR said, good morning, Steve. Fly, Eagles, fly. Appreciate you tuning in, buddy. Fly, Eagles, fly, man. Puerto Rico said, I really would like a monster fullback for the future. Different type of NFL. I think you could probably maybe um, get creative with what you're saying and maybe maybe convert a, goal, a guy like Jack Stone to a more diverse role where he's a tight end slash kind of a, a guy that you can use kind of in wing formations and lead formations. I think you could see something like that expand upon. RJ Fletcher said, it's just crazy how they laughed at us in the beginning of the season, simply just believing in our team. And now we are a playoff team. Hashtag fly Eagles fly. Yes. Yep. Eagles has landed said, uh, I don't think Jamison Williams is getting past that New Orleans at 15 pick. Yeah. Uh, hard to say, right? I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to say where guys are going to fall and, and who's going to get valued. Uh, he's definitely an explosive playmaker and, and you know, Alabama wide receivers have, had a pretty good trajectory of recent, <laughs> you know, Henry Ruggs was the first guy taken a couple of years ago. I know that's maybe bad mojo to say that name currently, but you know, truth be told, truth be told, he, you know, he was the first receiver taken in that draft. Then you go to, you know, we had two top 10 picks from Alabama last year. You know, he might be gone by the time we pick, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't hate it. I definitely wouldn't hate it. You know, back your birds podcast said getting, uh, Meche, even though he's injured, he's the only receiver I'd be okay with drafting, but otherwise I'd go free agency. We can't miss on a wide receiver anymore. I agree. We need to get guys that can separate and not play games. I agree with that part. Uh, do you think we should play our starters against Dallas? Uh, I think there's certain guys that should be rested. I don't think there's anything to, to really gain from playing Jordan Howard trying to play Miles Sanders, trying to play, you know, certain guys, like I would even probably, I, I probably wouldn't even play Hurts, to be honest. Um, just because, you know, why, why expose these guys to risk of injury? Why not let these guys that are already dealing with little nagging things heal up? There's just no point to it. Like 
you know, teams fight all year to get a bye week. And this is kind of the opportunity for us to capitalize having that potential, you know, opportunity for the bye week. Now, would I play, you know, a certain majority of the starters? Probably so, just because it's kind of hard. You know what I mean? Like, I'd probably rest Fletch and guys like that, but it's, it's kind of hard to sit all your starters. You know what I mean? So I'd, I'd probably play a handful of these dudes for at least the first quarter, if not into the first half. So, I mean, it's going to like what I'm advocating for is very much a preseason feel to the game. But if you're trying to stibli- you know, establish a rhythm, you know, you, you can definitely put a, a Garner Minshew in the game as the quarterback, keep your wide receivers in the game, you know, maybe rest Kelsey, but have Herbert get center and have the other guys, you know, on the offensive line to kind of establish a rhythm. I'd probably rest Driscoll if Driscoll – or not Driscoll. Driscoll's out for the year, my bad, guys. Um, Dickerson, just because he still he seemed to be injured in that game last week. So I don't think I'd play – I don't think I'd play him. But I would still keep a competent O-line around just to kind of try to get that early rhythm if we can. I, I definitely want to see the defense maybe try to keep guys out of the end zone in the first quarter. That would be nice. I'd like to see the offense maybe potentially establish rhythm and, and get some kind of points. Field goal, touchdown, something. we got to establish points in the first quarter of games because, you know, our slow starts have, have kind of been a problem here, RJ, to be honest. Tyrese Hayes, what's up, buddy? He says, how do you feel about Calvin Ridley with Smith? I mean, sign me up. I mean, I don't know how much money it would cost for somebody like that, and that's always – money's always the, the problem with the player, that scale and that ability, but we're just talking about player. You're like, yeah, you kidding me? Calvin Ridley and Devontae Smith? That's a crazy tandem. Miami pick is at 14 right now. I hope it stays at 14, Mad Hatter. <laughs> Bergang114 said, I'm guessing uh, Green, the guard, or Linderbaum, the center with the 14th pick. Uh, with our with our pick, Gardner, the cornerback, with the Indianapolis pick, Dean, the linebacker, Nakobe Dean. I don't hate that pick, man. I don't hate that series of guys. I'm Jim Ruiz said, who are your top three players in college football right now? Ugh. I'm a I'm a college football fan, Scott, so I, I really follow NC State and the ACC. I don't say that I have a top three, but I would say that Aiden Hutchinson is really high on my list of guys right now. Um, outside of Aiden Hutchinson, let's see. Let me think a little bit. I uh, can't remember. Some of the guys are slipping my mind. Their names, the, the young man from Utah, the linebacker, he's really high on my list. I think he's a really good football player. And then I, I honestly like I, I think Gardner, you know, Stingley's a good corner. There's, there's definitely really good corners, but I really like what I saw from Ahmad Gardner in terms of the fit for the Philadelphia Eagles. You know, he's a guy that I think needs to develop in zone, but in terms of getting a guy that can be physical and can play man and he just fights, I, I like him. I like him a lot, to be honest with you. Hurt season said, Why are we saying if we're going to beat the, <laughs> the Cowboys? We're going to be the super. We're going to be in the Super Bowl. I was confident all season that we'd win in 17. And honestly, I'm feeling the same way confidence this season. I'm talking about this uh, preseason game that's about to come up at week 18, man. Not necessarily. I'm not talking about the playoffs per se. But, uh, you know, I don't know if they're going to play their starters when we be playing our backups. Jason Williamson said, I think Dallas is going to sign Antonio Brown to replace Gallup next year. What do you think? No, I don't think they are because his – Unfortunately, because of the way things shook out, I think Tampa Bay still technically controls the rights, and they can basically choose to, to not allow him to come back. So it would really be up to Tampa Bay. But I don't think I, – I think he's done, guys. I don't think anyone's signing Antonio Brown. I think his, I think his NFL career walked out when he did that. Uh, Meche is really good. I want him somewhere. Uh, Backyard Birds podcast said, we have a cornerback at Bergang, but we do need defensive end safety or a linebacker, maybe center. Yeah, but you got to look at the secondary, man. You know, Steven Nelson's on a one-year deal, so he's a free agent after this year. Darius Slay is the highest-paid player on the team, and he's 31 years old. You know, we got a fourth-round guy we don't know a lot about yet, McPherson. You know, we have Tay Gowan, who's a guy that's very inexperienced. You know what I mean? Like, I definitely think if you can get a premier corner, you, you should probably, you know, take a take a gamble if you can there. I play the starters for a quarter. We need work on these on these starts, start to the game. Antonio Holmes said Bryce Young. Yeah, if we're just talking outside the draft, Antonio, I agree. But, you know, he's not eligible for this year's draft. But, yeah, he's, he's an incredible football player. Since he has a good defense that we can pick from, they do, actually. Hurt season said, oh, okay, laugh out loud. Gardner season for the Minshew game, laugh out loud. 
I, I don't think I'd keep him in the whole game hurt season. Sorry, Bird Gang Woman. For her. I don't think I'd keep him in for the entire um, duration of the game per se. I, I think I would, you know, kind of play him a quarter or so, then I'd bring in Reed Sinet. But yeah, definitely for like that quarter or so. At Backyards Birds Podcast, Steven Nelson is going to be a free agent. Though? Yeah, exactly. We have Gowan. Yeah, well, what does that mean, though, Backyard Birds, that we have Gowan? Gowan's played one year of, Divi- of Division One football. He opted out of the 2020 season. He was a community college transfer. I mean, I like Tay Gowan's measurables. I like what he did from an athletic profile standpoint. He has not played against adequate competition to really judge or grade him, so I don't really don't know where he is, like, I think that would be an incredible risk to take to bank on that. You just have Tay Gowan and you'd be okay. Uh, Tyrese Hayes says, I don't understand the logic that Eagles can't go far in the playoffs. It's going to be a wild card team that makes the Super Bowl. Why not us? Maybe. I mean, you know, whoever makes it to the Super Bowl for the NFC is going to have to go through Lambeau probably. Um, that's, that's the thing. And it's not an easy place to play in the winter, obviously. I mean, we're, we're a cold weather team, so, I mean, that helps us. But, you know, who knows? We'll see. I mean, anything's possible, Tyrese. You know, when you when you get to the playoffs, everyone's zero and zero, and you're on a one-game season every week. Uh, Mad Hatter said we should draft SEC players in the first few rounds. It's not a bad idea. They've been putting out NFL-level players, that's for sure. Aaron Watts, 12. What's up, buddy? He said, who had a better se- season, Will Anderson or, or Atkinson? Uh, that's tough, man. I'm going to probably say, honestly, I'm going to say probably Anderson from my perspective. But to be honest, without really digging into film, it's just a gut instinct. I need film to really declare something like that. You get what I'm saying, guys? Bird Gang said, I wish we traded our trap picks for proven players like the Rams do. I don't because the Rams are in a crap load of trouble from a cap standpoint. I don't think that's the way you go, Bird Gang. What do you think about Ahmad Garner from Cincy? I like him a lot, Romy, one more. I think he's a really good football player. I think he's a good fit for us, too. Draft any Alabama player as possible, no-brainer. Their safety is uh, projected to be a third-rounder. Anderson. <laughs> uh, Bird Backyard Birds podcast said, I meant for Gowan to take Nelson's spot in a free agent and cornerback. I'm not against drafting one. Yeah, I don't think I would award Gallon the spot, though, you know, to be honest, backyard birds. Um, I don't think Gallon's done any, you know, anything to make you think that. I mean, look, look, if he wins something out in, in a camp, you know, then and you run with the guy, you know what I mean? And they're going to get their first official chance to really evaluate him next year in camp. So that'll be a, a big step forward. But I don't think I would go in with like, oh, we're going to sign a low level veteran. You know, I, I get what you're saying. If we're going to draft a guy high a low level veteran. We're going to draft a guy high, then use Gowan as well. Like then, then I'm in on that, but I don't think I would go like another third, fourth round level cornerback, a low, low area free agent. And then Gowan, I just think, you know, I think that's a really, really risky. <laughs> oh my God. With the Super Bowl talk, be grateful. We made the playoffs and Rams have no, no picks for years to come. Yeah. I wouldn't want to be in their place guys. I think the Rams did everything actually the wrong way. I think they tried to buy themselves a victory, and that's just not the way things work, man. Team chemistry is a thing, and it matters, and they don't have it. What up, 2020? How you doing, man? He said, I'm late. It's all good, man. You can always watch the replay, guys. It'll be on the replay. T.O. Harris said, which linebacker do you like more, Dean or Lloyd? Uh, different. They're different style of linebackers. I, I like Lloyd better for what the Eagles potentially need here. I like N'Kobe Dean's athleticism. Um, if we did not already have a Davion Taylor type, then I would say N'Kobe Dean. But to be honest with you, Davion Taylor is more of a will. I think N'Kobe Dean, depending on the system, is projected to be a Mike still. So, I mean, they don't necessarily conflict with one another. Just it's really a preference thing, you know, honestly, for your scheme. I would take either player. I think either player can work on the Eagles, but I'd probably be a little bit more favorable towards Lloyd at this point. But I like N'Kobe Dean a lot. One good thing about playing the Packers, we're number one in rushing, and the Packers' run defense is ranked 31st. Very true, and it's going to be cold. And it hurts. It hurts to tackle people. Pun intended. <laughs> Drew Johnson said, true. 
we don't draft too good in the first round. Eh, it depends on how you're looking at it, man. I mean, yes, we've missed on guys, no doubt. But I'm not, I'm not going to say we don't draft well in the first round. I mean, Devontae Smith's a pretty good draft pick, you know. Fletcher Cox was a good draft pick, pick you know what I'm saying? Like, you got to give guys time to, you know, Brandon Graham was a good draft pick. Like, you got to give guys time to to develop, man. I think I think some of you guys don't realize how often other teams miss on the first round as well. Like, the top 12 picks, you know, you normally have a better shot at hitting on those picks. Anything past that, you know, it's a little more hit or miss. I noticed a lot of people I've been paying attention to Sauce lately. He's also tackles. Well, I like him a lot, personally. Drew Johnson said, my concern is this defense. Yeah, teams that overreach and overspend only have one year, then their teams get decimated. I mean, the dream team being a great example of, like, what can happen to you. All right, guys, I appreciate y'all. It's been an hour and 35 minutes. If I can ask y'all to do one favor as you exit out, if you like the content, guys, do me a favor. Hit that like button. It does a lot. I appreciate y'all. I'm going to either be back with a video tomorrow or I might live stream again, okay? So just kind of watch, guys. You might see that I'm I'm live again tomorrow at 9.05 a.m. So uh, we'll see. You know what I mean? Like, we'll just, just check out, guys. I'll try to put it up early so that way you guys can see it if I'm going to be back again tomorrow at 9.05. But I'll definitely either have a video for you or we'll do another live stream, guys. I appreciate y'all so much, guys, and uh, see y'all tomorrow. I might see y'all later today. I might put out a video again today. I think uh, Allie and I are going to do a live stream tonight. We're actually, I think we're going to break down some film. So I might be live again tonight, guys. So check me out tonight. <laughs> later, y'all. Bye.